I'm back in 1 Timothy once again, chapter number 2. And I've made it to verse 5. And like I said, we're just going slowly through 1 Timothy. I've already been through 1 Timothy. So if you're looking for a faster one, a faster verse by verse, I've already went through it once. You can find it on here. Now we're just going through it slowly, really looking at it, giving you a chance to look at the verses. And it's just fun to just go through the Bible verse by verse and just sit and talk about it. And we made it to verse 5 in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And what a great verse. This verse teaches you there's one God, not three. There's one God, one true God. And there's just one mediator. It's not Jesus Christ and Mary. It's not Jesus Christ or the priest. It's just one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It shows you Jesus Christ is a man, and it calls him a man. It doesn't call him a shim or an it. It's, it's a man. It's the man Christ Jesus. You know, he knew what he was, a man. He didn't try to come up with his own uh, new gender. He went into the men's bathroom, the man Christ Jesus. You see, the Bible does not give you more than two genders. It's male or female, man or woman, you see. The man Christ Jesus. He's the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Let's look, look at some verses about this one God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 5 through 6. I'm going to give you a chance to turn to it. If you've got a Bible, hopefully you've got a wide margin Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and look at verses 5 through 6. Okay, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. It says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So there's many that are called gods in heaven or in earth. As there be gods many and lords many. There's a whole bunch of gods. You know, Hindus believe in thousands of gods. Or however many gods they believe in. You got people that believe in multiple gods. You got people that have many gods and they don't even realize that they've got false gods. But there's just one true God. To us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we in Him. You see? There be many that are called gods. There be gods, men, and lords, many. But there is one God. So, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, one mediator. What's a mediator? One who brings two parties together and reconciles them. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for me. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life, fulfilled all righteousness, did everything that you would have to do to be considered perfect. Perfect all the way around, no sin. He, he did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He's the one that reconciled me. Let's look at some verses for this. Ephesians 2.16. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16. And this is a great verse about how he reconciled us. Ephesians 2.16. Ephesians 2.16 says, 
and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And Ephesians 2.15 said, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. You see, he is our peace. He is the one that reconciled me and God. He took my hand. The moment I believed on Jesus Christ, he took my hand. He took God's hand. He, we're no longer at enmity. He joined us together. Now, I'm a son of God. I'm more than what Abraham had. Abraham was a friend of God. I'm beyond that. I'm a son of God. I'm a part of the family of God. There's no enmity there anymore. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer enemies in our mind by wicked works. We have been reconciled to God by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Hebrews 4, 15. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, Jesus Christ, He came down, God in the flesh, He was in all points tempted, just like me and you are, but He passed the test every time, never gave in to the temptation. And when we believe on Him, if there was a moment you believed on Him, you have access to the Father. You're no longer at enmity. You're reconciled. And you can come boldly into the throne of grace anytime you want to, 24 hours a day, no matter where you are, and you can find grace to help in time of need because you've been reconciled. Now look at Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25. He is our mediator, and he is the one who brings us together with God and reconciles us. Hebrews 7.25, it says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He makes intercession for us. He's our reconciler. He's our mediator. It says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He's the only one that could do it because he's without sin. He's the only one that could do it because he's God in the flesh. He's the only one that could do it because he's God manifested in the flesh, fully God, fully man. So he's able to die for our sins and make re reconciliation for us. Now, 1 John 2 and verse 1. 1 John 2, 1. You see, you're saved now. You're born again because you believed on Jesus Christ. Your soul is saved, but you still got the flesh. The old man, it still wants to sin. But I got more good news for you. 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is our advocate. If you do sin, you got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You, you see, you look up the definition for advocate. 
And it, it's one who pleads the cause of another in a court of civil law. You see, the devil's the accuser of the brethren. He's going to come and accuse you before God. But then Jesus Christ is our advocate. He stands up and says, His sin don't matter. I paid for his sin. I died for his sin, past, present, and future. I'm the propitiation for his sin, for the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. Every sin that you have committed was future. When Jesus, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all your sins were future, and he died for all of them. Not just your past sins, not just your present sins, but your future sins too. You got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He paid for your sin debt, all of them. Jesus saved you when he knew all the sins that you would commit after you got saved. Think about that. He didn't just know about your past sins when he saved you. He knew about the sins that you was going to commit the next week after you got saved, and then the sins that you'd commit 15 years after you got saved, and then the sins that you'd commit all the way up until you died. And he still saved you. He's our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's our mediator, one who brings two parties together and reconciles them, and that's what he did. Jesus Christ is fully God, fully able to do the job. He's fully God, giving him the power to save. He willingly came down in the flesh as a man so that he could take on sin 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, on, God in him. He came down as a man to take on sin and die for man. Only he could do it. Fully God and fully man. He's one God, one, media, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You see, you don't need Mary. You don't need a priest. You got the Lord Jesus Christ. You go straight to him in prayer. It goes straight to the Father. Now verse 6, it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself a ransom for all. Now we're going to get back into more stuff that goes against the Calvinist teaching. You see, what's a ransom? It's the money a price paid for the redemption of a prisoner, and he paid the price for all. Not just a few. Not just for a certain elect. For all. Look at Second Peter 2 and verse 1. Second Peter 2 and verse 1. Second Peter 2 and verse 1. You see, Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. He paid the price for all. Not just me and you who are saved, but for all these people from beginning to end that never got saved. You see, he died for the sins of the whole world. Second Peter 2 1 says this, But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now this is lost people that deny the Lord Jesus Christ and that go to hell. Yet look what it says, even denying the Lord that bought them. Jesus Christ bought them, even though he knew that they would reject him and go to hell. They were still bought. He bought them. They rejected the payment. You see, the only difference between me and you and those lost people is we, we accepted the payment that Jesus Christ paid. They rejected the payment that Jesus Christ paid. We accepted the, the ransom. The, the ra ransom is the money or price paid for the redemption of a prisoner. And he paid the price for all of us. You either accept the payment or you reject the payment. You know, many people believe the facts. They believe that Jesus died for them. But they don't 
come to him and trust him to be their savior. They don't ever accept the payment. I believe the facts for many years. I believe that Jesus did die on the cross for my sins and was buried and resurrected. I knew the gospel. But when I was 21, I came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and I believed on him. I said, I want to accept the payment. And I believed on Jesus Christ to save me from my heart. And I've been saved ever since. Nothing could take it away. He bought me and I accepted the payment. Now, even if, if I never accepted the payment, he still bought me. Even though I, I would have never accepted him, he still, the fact remains the same. He bought me. He paid the price for all, not just a certain few, but all. He's a ransom for all. And, you know, you got verses like Matthew 20, 28 that they want to throw at you where it says, you know, he came to give his life a ransom for many. And they'll say that, you know, well, it's just, it's not for everybody. The ransom wasn't for everybody. It was just for many. Well, compare it with this verse. It says he made himself a ransom for all. All is many. You know, it, just because it says many doesn't mean just a few, just a certain ones out of the whole bunch. All is many. All men is many. You see that? You got all the men that ever lived. That's many men. And he paid the price for all of them. So when they throw that one at you, just say, well, all is many. So the saying that Jesus just saved or died for a certain few is not true. He paid the price for all. You got a some that accept the payment and they're going to spend eternity with the Lord. You got some that reject the payment. They're going to spend eternity in hell. But the fact remains the same. He died for all. He wants all men to be saved. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise to some men count slack must, but is long suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So he died for all. He gave himself a ransom for all. And Paul says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So Paul says, Whereunto I am ordained. So he's ordained. That means he's appointed. He's been prepared. Let's look at some verses that go along with this. Acts 14, 23. If you'll turn to Acts 14, 23. In Acts 14, 23. It says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So you see that? They, they ordained them. And ordained, if you look up the definition for ordained, that just simply means they appointed, instituted, established, and vested with ministerial or pastoral functions. They ordained them. They put them in a place to for the Lord to be in the ministry. They appointed. They prepared them. Look at Titus 1.5. Titus 1.5. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, on or ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. So this is something you, uh, he, Paul was even telling Titus to look for faithful men that he could ordain and set up as, as elders in every city. Men sit apart for the work. Now Paul was ordained. And you know what else? He's a preacher. It says, whereunto I am ordained a preacher. 
So he's ordained a preacher. Paul preached. He proclaimed some things. He proclaimed the word. 2 Timothy 4.2. This is what he preached. Paul was a preacher. Paul is ordained a preacher. And 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word. That's what Paul preached. It says, Preach the word. Be instant. In season. Out of season. This is what Paul did. Repro reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine. You got to be long suffering because it takes people a long time to catch on. You know, you get somebody saved, it takes them a long time to catch on to the doctrine. You got to be long suffering. Along the way, Paul has to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He's got to give them the doctrine. That's how they grow, is through the doctrine. So he's. He's a preacher of the word. And then Romans 10, 8. Romans 10 and verse 8. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That is what Paul preached. Salvation by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's a preacher of the gospel. So he's ordained. He's appointed and prepared. A preacher. Uh, Paul preached. He proclaimed the word. You see, let the Bible preach for you. You preach the word. You know, you got a lot of them that they never preach the word. It's just whatever they think of at the moment. They may not even have anything to do with the Bible. And it may turn out good many times when they do that. But there's nothing better than just preaching the word. Just getting in the word. Letting the word talk. Just like you go through it verse by verse. You're starting off with the word. You're expounding on the Word, and you compare the Word with the Word. That way, it's all about the Word of God, and not so much about you anymore. Not about you at all anymore. And you got the Bible itself for your illustrations. For every New Testament teaching that Paul's given me, if I need an illustration, I can just go back in the Old Testament, and I got all the stories I need. And that way I'm using God's stories to preach the word for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's nothing better than the word of God itself. Paul was a, a ordained, appointed, and prepared a preacher. What did he preach? The word. And look what else. He's also an apostle. Paul is an apostle. He's ordained a preacher and an apostle. Now, what is an apostle? It's one who is sent. And let's look at some verses about how Paul is an apostle. And let's see some things that's got to be there for you to be an apostle. Because, you see, there's a lot of people going around saying that they're apostles today. And they're getting people all messed up. You, watch out for people who go around calling themselves an apostle. Because there are no more apostles today. In Acts one twenty two, I'm going to show you what had to be there for you to be an apostle. It says in Acts one twenty two, Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, was, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, knowest, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Judas lost his apostleship. Matthias ended up being an apostle, being one of the twelve. 
but look at the requirement for it. Look at what it, what had to ha- had to be there for you to be an apostle. In Acts one twenty two, you had to be around during the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? You had to be around during when John was baptizing and be a, and see Jesus Christ and his resurrection body. And Paul was. Paul was around during these things. These people today were not around during these things. The people going around pretend to be apostles today do not have the size of an apostle. They do not have the requirements that are that need to be there to be an apostle. We're not apostles anymore. You know, he's gave pastors and teachers and evangelists, but you're not an apostle. Paul was an apostle. Look at 1 Corinthians 15:8. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. This shows that and you know, Paul saw the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. And he talks about 1 Corinthians 15, 5. It says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. This is speaking of after Jesus' resurrection. He was seen of Cephas, which is Peter. Then of the twelve. He was seen of all the apostles. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Paul saw Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. He said, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul proclaimed that he was apostle. He had the requirements there to be an apostle. Now look at first or look at 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. There are some things that go along with being an apostle. And if they're not there, you're not really an apostle. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul had the signs of an apostle. And it's not just one or two things. It's all the signs that the Lord Jesus gave the apostles. You know, you got a lot of them that are, claim to be apostles, and maybe they speak in tongues supposedly and maybe they supposedly heal people but what about the other signs are they able to be bitten by a snake a venomous snake and not be feel no harm are they able to drink any deadly thing could they take Drano and just suck it down their throat no because they're not really an apostle and they're only doing the signs that you can counterfeit Speaking in tongues, easiest one to counterfeit. Healing somebody, you can fake that easily. They're not apostles. They don't have the signs of an apostle like Paul had. You see, Paul had all the signs of an apostle. He could do any of them. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, you know what he said? He said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. He could, Paul could speak with tongues. And tongues is not some gibberish language that you just think of. Tongues are a known language that somebody in the world speaks. It's like in Acts chapter 2, every man heard them speak in their own language. And what you, was going on was the apostles who didn't speak these people's language. And they knew, the people knew that they didn't speak their language. Yet they got up and every man heard them speak in their own language. And that confirmed to them that these guys were bringing the true word of God because they had these signs and wonders. And Paul, he could speak with tongues more than any of them. Acts 19, 11 through 12. Acts 19, 11 
It says in Acts 19, 11, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. That's what he does with an apostle. He's not doing that with you. I don't care who you are. He's not doing these special miracles by the hands of Paul, by, the, by your hands like he did Paul. I mean, you may do some, God may do some miraculous things through you, lead somebody to the Lord, things like that but not like he did with the apostles. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now you cannot take a handkerchief that you've carried around with you all day and give it to somebody and heal their cancer, heal their HIV, or whatever they got going on. You can't do that. God is not giving you the signs of an apostle like he did to Paul. That's because it's the Jews that require a sign. 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, For the Jews require a sign. And God is not dealing with the Jews today. He's dealing with Gentiles, with the church. We don't require a sign. God was using these signs of an apostle through the Gospels and the early part of the book of Acts because... He was dealing with the Jews. He was offering the kingdoms to the Jews. The Jews rejected him. The sign gifts transition out. And you even see Paul at the end of his ministry. Uh, he doesn't even send Timothy a handkerchief. He says to just use a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. You see? The, the sign gifts like this, they transition out. And today we don't have the sign gifts anymore. Then look at Acts 28.5. You say, well, I've got the gift of healing. I can speak with tongues. Okay, well, can you do this? In Acts 28 and verse 3. Acts 28.3. And when Paul had gathered a bunch of bundle of sticks and had laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire, and felt no harm. You see that? Paul could be bit by a venomous snake, and not be hurt. It says, Howbeit they looked, when he should have swollen, are fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. You see, these people who uh, were barbarians, they, they didn't have no uh, concept of who the real god was or nothing. And when they saw Paul get bit by this venomous beast, they they couldn't believe it. It was a sign to them that something was going on with this guy. And that's what the sign gifts were. That's what the sign gifts were all about. I'm going to show you something else in Mark 16. This is God giving the signs of an apostle to the apostles. In Mark 16, verse 15. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now look what he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word. Notice that, confirming the word with signs following. That's what the sign gifts were about. It wasn't about to, sh to show that you were saved. You know, a lot of people teach that, you know, you're not saved unless you can speak in tongues, or they say you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you can speak in tongues. It wasn't about that. Uh, it wasn't to show how spiritual you are. It wasn't to show that you are filled with the Spirit, like they're trying to teach today. The sign gifts was to 
you know, you're going out to evangelize to unbelievers, specifically unbelieving Jews, and the signs, because 1 Corinthians one twenty two says the Jews require a sign, the signs of an apostle was to convince unbelieving Jews that the words that was coming out of your mouth was from God. And when they saw that supernatural thing be done, that special miracle wrought by the hands of Paul, it confirmed to them something different about this guy. He's a true guy. He's not just some fake deceiver. So Paul ordained, appointed, prepared a preacher. He proclaimed some things, specifically the word. He is an apostle. He had the requirements of Acts 20, 122. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. He had the signs of an apostle. He could speak with tongues. He could heal. He could take up serpents. He could, he could do any of it. He said, we're in two. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he said, we're in two. I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. You see, Paul was reminding Timothy, you know, probably after a while, Timothy got used to being around Paul, got used to all the miraculous things Paul did. Maybe he needed to be reminded. And Paul's reminded him, you know, Timothy, I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I'm not just Paul, your father in the Lord. I am an apostle. And I speak the truth in Christ. I ain't lying to you. This is the truth. I lie not. He says, I'm a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. You see, Paul is the minister to the Gentiles. Look at Romans 15, 16. Romans 15, 16. He said that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. See, Paul is a minister to the Gentiles. He's the minister to the Gentiles. That's me and you. Gentiles, is some, if you ain't a Jew, you're a Gentile. And see, he, he had a burden for the Jews. He said, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh or Israelites. He had a burden for the Jews, but his primary ministry was to Gentiles. You see, when Jesus Christ came and he had that ministry with the apostles, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Israel rejected. They rejected him. They rejected him by rejecting John the Baptist. They rejected Jesus himself. He still gave them another chance in the early part of the book of Acts. Finally, Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen. From there on out, you see him go to the Gentiles. And Paul shows up in Acts chapter 9. He makes him the minister of the Gentiles to us. You see the, the sign gifts fade out. The signs of an apostle fade out. And Paul, he, the Lord puts on him to be a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity just means truth. And Paul is a preacher of the truth. He's a teacher. Paul is a gift from the Lord. It says in Ephesians 4.11, it shows you, Ephesians 4.11, the Lord gave gifts. It says in Ephesians 4.10, He that descended is the same also that ascended, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You see, it says in Ephesians 4, He gave gifts unto men. Those gifts is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Paul is a gift to the body of Christ. And he was greatly used for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Paul is a gift from the Lord. And he's a teacher of the Gentiles, as it says in Romans 15, 16. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And since the oracles of God were committed to the Jews, Paul needed to teach the Gentiles the truths of the Scripture because they hadn't had the benefit of it. 
the Gentiles hadn't had the benefit of it. So he needed to go around to them and preach the truth and faith and verity. Verity just means truth. And we'll just stop right there. And then next time, we'll continue up with verse 8.